Okay, um, thank you very much for the nice um, invitation. It's an honor to, uh, to present our work that we have done here over the years in this kind of for the, for this audience here. So um, I will talk about molecular representations for drug discovery. And um, I should briefly set the scene a little bit like before so recently I've changed um, companies. So I'm now I'm at Pfizer since um, October last year. They are leading the machine learning research group there. So, and there are a couple of known faces. Maybe you know them. Um, Robin, um, Marco, they all have presented here before on the M2D2 um, conference. Um, so, but before that, I was like the last seven years at Bayer, and there was built also of machine learning research. And all the work that I present today was done before in my previous group. So, give us a little bit more time. We will also show cool stuff from Pfizer when it's ready, but now um, please be patient. Mm -hmm. So um, when I um, pitched always machine learning research to my higher management, it was always a, what can it bring to the table? And I always tell them, yeah, hey, look, we can develop intelligent system at a certain point that allows us to translate existing incoming inputs that can be acquired at a large scale into something that is typically very expensive. So the output of an assay, so if you know how solvable or toxic a compound it is, that costs a lot of money. But all the kind of inputs that we have, like structural information, it's easy to acquire. We have that in our pharmaceutical companies at large scale. So therefore, that's what we are developing. We are trying to develop these kind of models and very often methods also. So um, maybe a little bit of contrast to many other get, um, research lab and in industry, we put a very, very strong focus on publishing work, our work. So over the last three years, we have published more than 30 papers among Europe's ICML, nature, communication, but also in some like um, theoretical chemistry work papers. So that gives us a lot of credit to work and to get funding from an external funding agency like European Union. We are involved in those kind of, and that gives me the possibility to do research that is officially not funded by my management because I now have the PhD student to do work. And what we also do, we develop software with love. So every algorithm that we have developed, everything has always become publicly available as long no private derived um, weights from the models are included. So what are we working on? So we are working on learning representations for molecules or learning like certain models like protonation state, PKA models. So we have developed a model called PKA that is 1000 times faster than pi PKA, but almost having the same accuracy. We have modeled probably one of the first in silico model for solubility prediction. It's nothing very secret. It's a graph convolutional model with multitask setting at the end point there, the problem was like how to do the proper cast task grouping on the task rating. We're working a lot also on work on learning embedding on transcriptomics data, proteomics data. We do many, many work on analyzing cell painting data, so high content imaging screens, and we work also on learning embeddings on the, on the biological space. So I'm trying to explain a little bit like maybe it's not the right audience here to play in structural property. So it's, a, it's an ongoing problem since, uh, since the beginning of chemistry, going almost like 600 years back, if we want to identify what does the certain chemical structure do it. And in the 50s, people tried to be very clever and use spider nets to identify what is, a, um, is this is a, um, what the chemical structure is doing to a certain biological system. So what you can see there, it's more like a fun picture. So first of all, it's not very reliable. It's probably not a good model to explain the toxicity or a certain activity of a compound, but something that you can derive very easily. Like if you would be a spider, you would probably need a finger away from sleeping pills or coffee. So, um, so but there's better things what we can do. And lots of what we are doing there is like always the same. Again, we have some kind of input molecular structures. We want to predict certain bioactivity on, and we have to build something on the top of it. So the workflow for that is always the same. So we always start with some kind of a data creation a startup where we identify the training data set of bio and bioactivities and structures. And then we want to exploit a certain principle that a certain group of ligands show semi-chemical similarity. And we use some by this paradigm that if they are showing this kind of similarities that they are probably also very likely to show the same activity on the other subset of the target. So the problem is then always like, how do you represent a molecule? Mm -hmm. And it's uh, since we are in the French speaking part, I think I would show up in my French lecture that I had at high school, but that's obviously not a molecule. 
So the question is now, how we represent a molecule. That is a lot of information, how you can do it, you can structure it from, from the molecular formulation up to the molecular graph or to the smiles, which share exactly the same amount of information between them. Then you can go more information which to a representation like 3D conformations or then electron densities. So, but that's how our computer needs those kind of data. So at the end, we have either on the molecular graphs a node and adjacency metric, some kind of an automatic embedding. Um, if we use internal coordinates, or if we want to work on density, electron densities, then we work on voxels or grids. So, but this is all stuff when I started working in, 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 uh, at Bayer, tried all this kind of stuff up. And there's like, how do we want to, which kind of descriptor to take and how we represent it. So in the beginning, there was a lot of work, almost all the kind of work was done in the field of computation and chemistry was using the working house extended connectivity field. It's a wonderful descriptor, very fast, very reliable, good results. It was pretty hard to outperform it. So therefore I was super frustrated. And I said like, you know, I've spent these weeks on training networks and at the end performance was not doing better than doing some ECFP with a random force. And therefore, we thought it's time to invent our own descriptors. And that is work that is pretty much inspired a little bit by this very similar paper by Gomez and Pombarelli. But we'd make that a little bit tricky. So we trained a very, very simple sequence to sequence model with lots of gated recurrent units to make a neural translation between a representation that is equivalent to its output, but is not synthetic, sent from the syntax as a different syntax. So, so we try to translate from smiles to its canonical form during this kind of um, autoencoder-like architecture. And during the training step, we are also trying to predict certain downstream tasks like polar surface, molecular weights, everything that you can also derive from the chemical structure. Right? So it's a very simple and very efficient um, autoencoder architecture. We have published it in, in chemical science. But the main idea what we wanted to have, we wanted to have a fixed size embedding that is super information rich, that is also smooth. That means if you make a small steps and epsilon closed map in, the, in, the, in this Latin space, that you suddenly don't end up with a completely chemical, different chemical matter. So a little bit the motivation also why this neural translation helped there a lot. So this is the training process that you see. If you train different kinds of translation tasks, so between the smiles to the canonical smiles, from the smiles to a, um, canonical smiles, or from canonical smiles to canonical smiles in red. And what you see that the translation task is obvious. It's if you translate only between the same input and output, it's much, much easier. So you achieve much higher accuracy, much faster. But if you take the same embedding, and so during the training step and trying to predict some time downstream tasks like lipophobicity or um, a classification tag aims, then you see that those embedding is not very information, it's very poor performance. Compared if you take a more complicated system like translating from the smiles, from arbitrary smiles, and the network has to learn to make its canonical smiles out of it, then the network is learning to the syntax and the meaning of the grammar of the smile string, because otherwise it cannot reconstruct it. And that gives us a much, much better accuracy because the network is really learning the underlying chemistry. We tested this on different kinds of benchmark data sets, internal data set, and so on, in different kinds of settings, cluster leaf one out, I think, and for regression and for classification. And what you see, it's not always outperforming all the other methods. I'm not claiming that. But the beauty is, like if you compare, for example, to ECFP fingerprints or something like that, you always have to make a decision why you want to watch kind of hyperparameter. How do you want to parameterize your ECFP algorithm? The number of um, of neighboring atoms, the number of the hashing, what kind of algorithm you want to put on top. And what we always did, we used this very simple support vector machine at the output of our ECFP, of our CDD descriptor. And in almost all cases, we outperformed even graph convolutional networks and ECFPs. So the nice beauty with it is since we have this Latin space as input, as this autoencoder architecture, we can now try to take a look in this Latin space. Now what we, what, what we did there, we embedded Campbell in the Latin space, projected and um, calculated the PCA on it, and then walked along the first principal component in this Latin space and generated and, and assembled then um, new molecules. 
Um, and what you see here, we started with an aspirin. If we go into the first principal component, then see that the first principal component is clearly related only to the molecular size. While if the second principal component is clearly related towards the polarity of the molecule, that's also nice. So the network is also, so even by this very super unsupervised techniques, um, we can re-identify at least certain principles, chemical principles. So then we wanted to test out how we just can use all these embeddings for learning QSAR models. And there, there are basically always like these three kinds of models. What you can do, you can have a single task model where you have for each target one model that predicts the bioactivity for a known protein. You can have a multitask model. The problem there is that like that you cannot really make any prediction for an unseen target that you have never seen. So it, then it will never generalize to something completely new. And therefore we decided it would be cool if we would take the embedding from the protein and from the target and, and from the ligand into the input, because and then we can make a classification or a regression task depends on each tuple ligand um, target that is available in our training set. And it would increase us also our training size. And so the underlying principle is very simple. If a certain protein is sharing a certain domain and maybe on this domain, there is a certain certain pocket, then it's very likely that the second protein that shares the same domain part, at least of it, also expose the same pocket. And so for it's likely that the same ligand could bind and also to the second two, two proteins. Um, so, but the question then here again, is it like, so what kind of descriptor do you want to use for the protein part, for the protein embedding? And, you know, there's lots of kind of stuff that people always use, like being taken like FISCHEM embedding for each amino acid and then calculated some PCAs on it. You can 3D embedding, all this kind of stuff. So what was a little bit frustrating for us, we used the same approach and then a couple of days before we were ready for publishing everything, um, our friend Muhammad Agarashi has presented his UniRep um, um, embeddings and then work was done. Okay, but nonetheless, we use the same embedding then to reconstruct or to embed a protein in this Latin space, a curriculum learning approach. So we started with very, very small, more peptide lights, um, 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 amino acid sequences, and then we slowly grow them when, the, when our embedding reached, um, when our reconstruction accuracy of the network reached a certain um, accuracy. Um, now, then we use, they have developed this kind of models for our protein, proteochemochemetric embedding. So now we use also um, Akarashi's work here, um, encode the protein, and then we encode the ligand using our CDD. And then we also encode additional information about the environment in which the kind of measurement was done. So something about the assay. It's, it's a biochemical assay or is it a cell-based assay? It's very important because if you have a cell-based assay, you cannot really say that the compound is not maybe, maybe binding very well to the target, but it's just not been able to penetrate the cell membrane. So therefore, it's, um, we use it to, um, to change that as well. Um, we additionally made a multitask regression model out of it because there are relationships that you can exploit between the PCI, um, the, between the PIC50 values and the lipophobicity. So we included there also other other properties to predict them there. That was um, quite nice because thereby we could um, um, borrow strengths across the task. Um, I cannot share the uh, reveal the, the genetic and uh, the targets we are working on, but we have roughly for, for more than 400 target peers in correlation about or larger than 0.6. So in industry setting, those models where you have a Pearson correlation or a roughly larger than 0.4 are already considered to be used because it's much, much better than random guessing. So, um, did I miss something? No, we have published in this, the work as well. So, but the beauty also is now, since we have this encoder decoder architecture, we can now also embed a starting molecule in this descriptor space. If we then make a small epsilon shift to it and then get in our new descriptor, we can decode it again to a new molecule. And that's what we have done multiple now. Um, we have developed a, a very, very simple algorithm. It's a particles form optimizer, nothing fancy, absolutely not. But Microsoft Research and Novartis and also picked it up and confirmed our results. We have benchmarked this uh, also against the junction tree variation autoencoder or against the graph policy network. 
to make a multi-objective optimization of a compound towards several properties like binding towards the target and having certain molecular properties like being soluble. And that is a little bit the experiments in. So you can, it's really nice because you can guide your experiments um, towards this binding EH, EHGF1, um, EGFR, and, but not against base one, for example, but also coming up with this kind of probability that the solubility should be fine, that should be metabolic stable, and so on forth. The beauty actually is that you can do this in 10 minutes, not to wait like eight hours or one day, or depends how, you're, how you probably select your, your um, denoising um, sampler for, um, for the early your diffusion process, and if you want to condition it. So it really is fast. Um, so that is our approach for human in the loop um, centered design ideation process. We call it a green fly, especially like with this German umlauts, because I thought it would be super fun to see our colleagues in the States trying to find the, 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 the setter on the keyboard. Um, and what does Greenify is? So Greenify takes our CDD embedding. Um, so that is reversible. It combines us with multiple molecular property models that we have to develop together with a very efficient algorithm that allows us to do multi-objective optimization. Um, with our works that we have published in chemical science about retrosynthesis planning and computer-aided synthesis planning for multiple objectives, and together with an interactive user interface that we have published in bioinformatics. And what does Unify look like? Ah, it's public source. Everyone can use it. Uh, so Unify starts with a Marvin sketch. You can um, sketch in your molecule of interest as a starting point. It has a programmatic interface, so you can easily register all kinds of models that you want to use with a Python interface. You have some kind of desirability scores. You can register as many points as you want to have. Behind each object that you want to optimize, there is something like desirability curve editor. So for a certain point, it makes sense to optimize solubility. But when it, solubility has reached a certain point and it's sufficient so that you don't have to drink 2,000 liters of water to solve your molecule, then you maybe don't want, uh, then until you then, you probably want to optimize it. But at a certain point when you can drink it with a glass bottle of water, then it's fine, okay? So um, what then happens is it like, the particle swarm optimizer starts after a few iterations, um, a couple of molecules are suggested to the, um, to the, to the chemist. Um, the chemist has the operability, has a chance to ban molecules if they don't like it. They can also like the molecule. That means in the next iteration step, we will give them more weights. So between each of those panels, you see like all predicted molecular properties. And if you put them in a card, then you can also do the completely reaction planning. So what is the kind of compound, um, what would be the, 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 the root synthesized the denote compound? Um, fantastic work, great colleagues. They all joined Pfizer now. Um, so the other pocket now is switch gears a little bit like this is the Novo design with phenotypic screening data. So um, I, I like always using working on screening data where we have lots of data that you can use to inform your models. So high content imaging screens at, at Pfizer or at Bio also, they have their typically large scale screens where you can easily have millions of phenotypic readouts. So wouldn't it be nice to somehow generate or take this data to, uh, to condition your generative models on it? The problem is that, like always, if you are, there is a disconnect between the biochemical and the cell space. If you take a cell, you insert a genetic perturbation or a chemical perturbation, then you very often get some kind of a readout, like a transcriptomic readout, proteomics readout, some whatever. But we can take only those two here, the transcriptomic and the cell painting readout, for example. So the problem here is that if you cluster, um, each point here is an experiment where you have a certain cell, treated with certain kind of compounds. If you now cluster those compounds for this inhibitor, then you see that they cluster very nicely together in the chemical space. But if you now do the same clustering in the transcriptomic space that you will see that bioactive compounds from the same target not necessarily lead to the same transcriptomic retos profile. So there is a very, very strong disconnect. So we thought it would be very nice if we could generate and generate, if we could develop a generative adversarial network at that time, 
and condition the generator process on the chemical perturbation that can be done either in the phenotypic, I call it an imaging result, cell painting, or if we take um, transcriptomic results and thereby get an optimized scaffold that's also showing or more likely to lead to the same phenotypic response that we would expect. This is work that we also have published at Nature Communication and Digital Discovery. And here is some kind of example for gene expression, um, overexpression um, knockout that was for generator networks that was purely trained on chemicals. So, and now you can take the genetic perturbation coming um, from a cell painting stream um, where you have a gene expression uh, overexpression. And what you see here, it's like for we, we benchmark it. We take a gene expression overexpression for breast cancer one. And then we wanted to see if our network can recover known agonists from a different data set that was never part of the training. So in our training procedure, our networks have never seen the knowledge about the biological target that is behind. It's purely everything is informed over the, the phenotypic fingerprint. So then uh, these are enriched scaffolds. We benchmarked it also and see that this is highly significant. We do the same for NF kappa beta one. And also again, here also we can generate a scaffold that is highly likely to, to induce this kind of um, phenotype. Um, we also exploited this principle a little bit further by doing the interpolation. So first of all, in the molecular embedding space, that is nothing really fancy. People have done that before. But we wanted to do also the kind of linear embedding if we do it in the in the um, phenotypic expression. Um, so what you can see here is it like if you if you keep the overexpression overexpression profile fixed, do the interpolation between the sort and the endpoint that you see, which eats up if you condition on the phenotypic speed, you get a more likely compound that is likely to reduce again the fingerprint. A little bit what we have to see is that is only the information that's coming from the critic network, okay? So, uh, and the same is now, if we do the same classification for the DMSO profile, you see here again, that's much better would be what you expect if you would um, go for a random one, it would be if you would go for the top PCA component, the phenobiking space, but if here is, if you, if you take um, to optimize against NF kappa beta. So it's also much more likely to do that. Um, how much time do I have? Ah, oh, 20, plenty of time. Okay. Um, so um, there's another nice thing is like what we can do here is also using um, the same embeddings that we have trained before for solving a couple of molecular inverse problems. Um, so in this case, a molecular inverse problem, if you take a resonance spectrum and you want to do structure elucidation, so what's the chemical structure behind that? Um, so inverse problem are notorious hard. So especially if you work with a constraints problem where you want to reconstruct a, a graph one, there's a graph isomorphism problem. So forward pass can be very simple, but the reverse part is super hard. So um, it was like for doing the molecular depiction to inverse it to the molecular structure, that was a problem almost unsolved for 30 years of, of research. Um, so what would we have done here again? So again, this is our decoder encoder architecture. We wanted to, to inverse molecular representation that come that stem from hashed ECFP fingerprints. ECFP fingerprints were always considered to be irrevertible due to the complexity because you have here this, this um, hashing function and due to the hashing, you always have these splits collisions. So um, people tried it before. So if you want to, um, to hash down from a 2 billion space to a 1,000 dimensional space, you have no chance to do that. So what we have done here a little bit different. So again, we just primitively um, trained like a fully connected feedback, a, a fully connected network, for, feed forward network um, on to make a regression on the CDD. And since the decoder part is already pre-trained before, it can always be used to a, because the chemical structure. So it was very important work because there was this kind of European Union funded project called Melody, where we had a consortium of 10 pharmaceutical companies that wanted to share chemical structures together with their bioactivity data. 
And they had this great idea that we would do a folding with 3,000, um, 32,000 bits um, that would increase the probability that we get good models for predicting certain downstream tasks like um, bioactivity or admin endpoints. But on the other hand, we showed if you if you fold this and that such at that high, you can almost in a very very hard setting in a cluster split setting, almost two thirds of of the molecules perfectly. So um, that would mean so we have, would have disclosed a lot of our chemical knowledge and all the other part, uh, companies as well. So therefore, that was not one. And that is also a big problem. So because we cannot easily share chemical structure even in, the, in such conform form of a representation. Um, so another problem I, I addressed this before is like this um, um, molecular depiction, reversing the molecular depiction. So we have an influx of roughly 2,000 life science relevant papers every day. No human being on earth can read that. So we need very good algorithms that can extract the information very fast from it. And that could speed up the drug discovery process and at the end also save lots of lifetime. Um, so it's, just a, it's a typically also a very hard problem because you have different kinds of um, atoms that you have to identify, but you also have to identify the different kinds of bonds between. So really, as I mentioned before, people tried this for many, many years. Um, so here we again use, use, use our same architecture. We do the interpolation in this molecular space. Um, it's a visual transform. It's a visual, um, no, no, not even that, not in this case. It's a very simple, straightforward convolutional neural network. We do the um, regression task, also do it doing all this kind of augmentation. And it works quite nicely. So here is a little bit like the architecture. We start here first with the kind of molecules embedding and um, smiles representation. We embed it into the form of the, of, the, of the molecular depiction. And on the same time, we take the decoder to get our CDD representation. Once we have it, we learn the regression task from the, um, from the image to the CDD. And then again, we can take our CDD decoder to decode it to the smiles of interest. So um, we wanted to make it completely invariant. So therefore we had to train it with different kinds of augmentations on the molecule. And also, um, and you can see that sometimes the more atom bonds are excessively modeled. Sometimes we had this kind of super atoms here and, and so on, all different kinds of depiction algorithms. And um, we benchmarked it on, on all existing benchmark data sets. We also created again, our own benchmark data set against um, all existing methods that were out there at that time. And you can see there a very, very nice improvement compared to other algorithms. So we can really improve sometimes up to 90% perfectly reconstruct um, the molecule from the depiction. Mm. There is a clear tendency, so it's, it's obvious. So the larger the molecule becomes, the more harder it is to do accuracy and precisely um, identify the, the graph. So the other thing is it like, oh, yeah, it's actually not. But we are doing there a quite good job. Um, computational cost is maybe also something that is always of interest. So you 5,000 um, images can be done in less than um, 1,000 seconds. That is super fast. That means you can use this algorithm then also for um, real time augmentation of um, um, on, on works I will show later. Mm -hmm. So um, another question is also, does those algorithms then generalize to hand-drawn images? Yes, they do that also. So up to two thirds of all hand-drawn molecules can be also precisely re-identified with it. And that's a little bit like the final work now. Now, what we are now doing, we are developing a Chrome extension that allows the chemical um, biologist to read a paper and during, the, during reading the paper, can automatically hoover over the molecule, the convex hull around the molecule is identified. Then we get the extract, make the, the image extraction, calculate the smiles, and then we query the smiles against our internal databases to see what is available. Do we have this compound on stock? What does um, the chemical, um, what does our models predict towards solubility or other activities of interest? And with that, I'm already in my last slide here. So, I hope that I could show you a little bit like that. It's quite cool that with those unsupervised learned representation, you can do very fancy stuff in industry also. So we have developed a state-of-the-art chemical descriptor. I showed you how we can use those descriptors to optimize molecules under multiple constraints. 
also to, be, to uh, guide a generative process under, um, under phenotypic or um, assay readouts, and also how we can use those kind of descriptors to more to solve molecular inverse problems. Uh, Acknowledgements, that's super. Uh, I'm so happy to have those guys here, brilliant guys. Um, thank you. Um, also, thank you, very grateful for the, um, for the funding that I have received. Um, Ellen, Julian, and Mika, they will come up with cool papers that you will see soon. And um, with that, I'm just happy to say thank you. Have any questions? And, and we have open PhD positions. So if anyone wants to join our group, drop me a note. Thank you very much. All right, another great presentation. And uh, if you have questions, please go to the mic. Uh, it's great to see all like these different models that you have worked with uh, and the seeing like which one works, which one doesn't. So really like all the space of possible ways of treating a molecule. Yeah, that is, that is a beauty really work in pharmaceutical research. We don't have to work on one modality and we can work from like along the full drug discovery spectrum continuum. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your talk. I just want to ask when the Chrome extension is going to be available. Pardon, one, one. When the Chrome extension will be available. Ah, uh, that is a good question. So uh, to be honest, that will be probably the maybe the first one um, that we will probably make not publicly available. Because it's, it's like, you know, that is now, now we are in a situation where I probably have to invest money because I don't want to put my, my people on, uh, on developing boring Chrome extensions. So yes, they should do cool research. So therefore I have to invest money and then it's like hard to make an investment open source again. Great, makes sense, okay. thanks. <laughs> uh, great, great talk. Um, what, do you have a, a quick, um, uh, like a question, did you have, did you explore any joint uh, representations between the small molecules and say target proteins? Um, and do like joint uh, representations or, or maybe like uh, you know, joint encoding spaces, like, a, like some like contrastive space between the uh, 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 small molecule and a target protein. Um, so like, is it like jointly encoding the two together? So I, I'm, I'm not really sure if I get the question correctly. So if we have compared the representation between the target representation, the embedding for the protein and the ligand representation, or what do you mean? With yeah, this? so like one single representation yes. for the ligand and the target together. Ah, uh, no, we have not done that, but that is definitely things that we could think about, like, you know, no. Mm -hmm. But that would require also like 3D representations, right? All the work that we have done where was like on sequence-based representations. You could do the sequence, right? Because you have good sequence representations of proteins and you have, you know, decent, good sequence representations of uh, small molecules, right? With the smile string inputs. So maybe you could train with um, just I mean, what, that is what we have done. Our proteochemical model used the ligand representation and the target, as also the protein representation right. together. And then we do some kind of later fusion to combine them. I think so. The talk. So, I'll admit I was a little surprised how different the uh, imaging and the transcriptomics were clustered when you showed the one perturbation there. Could you speculate on a little bit about why that might be? Um, where did you see that it was so surprised between the imaging and the and the transcriptomic? Because at that kind, I mean, we used only the phenotypic readouts of the image, but for knockout experiment. So we never showed, I never, I think I have not shown any results on transcriptomic uh, readouts. Okay. Where were you? I mean, if you flip back through it, I can say, but yeah. maybe I just misunderstood it. Yeah, I can tell you what you mean. It was like some sort of CA like plot with red and blue dots on it. Oh uh, yeah, that one? Further back. Ah, that one. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, maybe it can be two thirds that this. Oops. Um. Uh, are you really so surprised about that? So because it is like something that is very often like the biological space is completely noisy. There is so much of 
there is so much of biological noise in the data. So while the chemical space is in reality much clearer. Hmm? So um, on the other hand, it can be also, so even activity could be also that it leads I mean, uh, okay, the activity towards here, it's also has to do with the, with, the, with the experimental that was done, okay? So it can be that this is one different kind of assay, biochemical assays, which maybe lead to the same phenotype in the readout. So then something is active or inactive, but it's in the biological space having coming complete different kind of mechanism. Okay, thanks. Yeah? 